Okay, so this is Unit 6, 7B in the textbook. This is the section on language. It covers pages 313 to 322. This is video 9 and 10. And I'm not sure how much time we will have left in class to review this information. So this might be something that you need to ask questions if you're struggling with the concepts. So the kind of the big ideas of this section is how does language develop for an individual? What are the different parts of language? The morphemes, uh, phonemes, grammar, syntax, and synax. Um, whether it's receptive or productive language. What's the critical time in which you should be developing language? And then what is linguistic determinism? Okay, so let's overall just kind of talk about language. Are spoken, written, or signaled words in which ways we communicate with others? So are spoken, written, or signal words and the way we combine them to think and communicate with others? A lot of people stated, researchers, psychologists stated, this is what sets us apart from other animals. Noam Chomsky, a big person who studies language, you should know that name. He stated, so far as we know, what makes us so unique from other species is this idea of language. Essentially, we're kind of like aliens up there. We are just making really vibrations in the air, okay, which can create, and it's kind of extremely um, bizarre, that it creates a communication system between us and other humans. So explaining language development, okay, there's two different people you should know, Skinner and Chomsky. Skinner is our behavioralist, okay? He believes that language is learned like everything else through association, intimidation, and reinforcement. Okay, so if you look at kind of underneath um, the nurture there, uh, that's a picture of Skinner. He's our nurture guy, and he believes that the way in which we talk has been taught to us. We am, are imitating our parents. Okay, we are being reinforced by our parents, and we learn that. We're kind of like the blank slate. We learn it through experiences. Chomsky, however, he's our nature guy. Okay, he believes, although specific language is learned, he believes that children are also pre-wired with the capability to learn language. So it's something that we, obviously, yes, it's something that we learn, but we have this initial um, grounding that we are pre-wired with something. The brain is like a language acquisition device. So we have some sort of basic um, wiring system that will allow us to be able to talk. Here they are again, Skinner and Chomsky, just kind of reviewing it. Skinner, development through learning principles, experience and association. Chomsky, again, we're pre-wired with a sort of switch box that needs to be turned on or turned off in order for us to understand language. Okay, so let's look at the language structure. The first part of the language is we're just going to look at the individual words and we're going to talk about phonemes. Phonemes is the smallest distinct sound. Um of that term or of that smallest succinct sound unit. So if I were looking at bat, it has three different sound units. Ba, at. Okay, so there's three phonemes. Chat, ch, at has three. Okay, the English language has 40 phonemes. We look at hat, ha, at has three. Versus when you're looking at morphemes. Morphemes are the smallest unit that actually carries meaning. So phonemes is more about the sound. Okay, morphemes talks about the meanings of the words. Okay, this includes prefixes and suffixes. So here's three examples. Okay, you have gentlemen. Okay, there's two meanings to gentlemen. You could talk about gentle and you could talk about man. So there's two morphemes here. Preview, what would you think? Two, right? Pre and then view. And then girlfriend. So you could do girl and then friend. Here's one more. Hopeful. You could do hope and you could do full. They provide two meanings here. Okay, so let's kind of reflect back to English class. We're going to talk about grammar. There's a couple components to grammar. There's the semantics, so kind of the rules. And then there's the, the rules of the words. And then the syntax is kind of the rules of the order in which you put things in a sentence. So grammar is the system of rules that allow us to communicate. 
Okay, so how are we going to set up our communication system? If we just shouted out words, there would be no meaning behind them. People would be confused, be very chaotic. So they had to set up a system of rules. All right, the semantics help describe the words themselves. So these are when you add ing or ed to a word. So a set of rules that help us derive meaning from morphemes. Adding an ed to a word will allow us to understand that it's past tense. Okay, adding S's to a word help us allow, um, allow us to understand that it's plural, right? Syntax is the rules for combining words into grammatically sensible sentences in a sentence. So this is kind of like the order in which you place words in the sentence, okay? For English language, you place adjectives before the nouns, okay? So red hair, this is indicating that the hair is the noun, Okay, and that my hair is red, so you place it before it, the adjective. Black cat, you don't say cat black. Okay, it helps us understand um, ways in which we communicate with one another easier. Language development, we have two different things that happen with us. We have the receptive language, we have productive language. Receptive language is actually hearing the language, so babies begin to understand speech and communication first. Okay, you hear people talking to you. Okay, you figure out who is stating the term, what the term actually starts meaning, okay, and then the different tones of terms. Okay, so I look at my niece and nephew, and they're first hearing all these terms, doggy, 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 and eventually then the second step that usually starts happening is they're able to produce those terms. Okay, usually it begins with one word speech. So here's kind of the development of what's supposed to happen with language. Babbling usually starts happening first. Begins around four, they make random noises, okay, um, and then around ten, babble's restricted to the noises that they hear at home. So at first, they're just babbling, 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 anything, and then they start noticing a change in the babbling. They start noticing that they're babbling words that maybe they hear, okay. Around 12, um, 12 months, a year, usually kids are beginning to produce language, um, and it usually starts exploding around 18 months. Now, every kid is differently depending on their developmental style, okay? But they say usually an average kid starts stating one or two, uh, one or two words about 12 months, and then their vocabulary is going to start exploding around 18 months, all right? Two words are usually spoken. That's known as the telegraphic speech around two years old, okay? And they're beginning to follow the syntax clues, all right? So they're saying... Um, hot dog, or they're saying red hair, or they're saying um, red mouse, all right? So they're putting the words in order as they should, okay, around two years old. Cookie, please. Big teddy, okay? After two, they begin to gradually um, start having the phases um, begin to get longer and longer and longer, and usually beginning by kindergarten and first grade is when they actually start beginning to actually read a lot of the terms in which they're, they're grasping. Okay, the critical period, most people say, must be exposed to either a spoken or a sign language by the age of seven um, or cannot learn any language. And some people, it's really kind of, we're looking at case studies who kids were never taught a certain amount of language because of social isolation and they found that some kids can't ever develop if they don't learn it by this critical period in the brain development if they don't learn it by seven they're going to struggle and they might never learn a language okay after seven even learning another language is harder okay so that's why they say we should be teaching um kids two different languages in grammar school because they have those um those connections in their brain ready for them to use. And if you don't use it, we've talked about this before, you're going to lose it. Okay, as a quick little reminder, let's kind of talk about the parts of the brain that deal with language. Paul Broca found out that the Broca area, which is located in the left frontal lobe, allows us the ability to speak. Okay, and then the Wernick area, which is located in the left temporal lobe, allows us the ability to comprehend. So you might still be able to talk with the Wernix, but you're not going to be able to understand anything of what you're talking about. All right, you can speak, but only meaningless sentences. All right, the last section of, your t of this section talks about um, thinking and language. Benjamin Lee Worf was somebody who had some ideas about language. 
Um, he thought that different languages impose different concept of reality, which is known as language determinism, um, which impacts the way we think. But although Waroff's linguistic determinism hypothesis suggests that languages determines thought, it is more accurate to say that language influences thought. Different languages embody different ways of thinking, and the immersion into bilingual education can enhance thinking. We often think in images when we um, use implicit non-declarative procedural memory. Our unconscious memory system for motor and cognitive skills and classically and operately conditioning association, um, thinking in images can increase our skills when we mentally practice upcoming events. So essentially, learning more languages can allow us to become more diverse and have more mental images on what we have. Okay, so kind of the big idea here, again, maybe you want to create a hierarchy. Okay, the, the, um, I would say the five big areas in which they explored with language was the development. Okay, is it something we're born with or something that we experience? The different parts of language that we kind of went over. Um, whether language is receptive stuff we hear or is it the stuff that we're producing the critical time in which you're supposed to be able to be exposed to certain languages and then linguistic determinism 